I've lived in Los Angeles uh, a long time, and um, the thing that's always struck me about living there is it's such a divided city between extreme wealth and a large part of the city which uh, is completely disenfranchised. Um, and when I read about the Grim Sleeper case, I thought it was a great vehicle for looking at Los Angeles, looking at the part of Los Angeles that is very unrepresentative, unrepresented. Uh, a lot of people don't have the vote in it. And I thought more than anything, this would be an opportunity maybe to get their point of view and to get that part of the city talking for itself. And I think what's, what's happened in LA as in many other places since the 70s is that all those outreach programs that had existed were to involve the other part of Los Angeles going in, setting up medical centers, startup programs, re you know, education programs have all ceased to exist. And so you have this whole part of the city which is completely cut off from the rest of the city. And I think this is what happens when you allow that situation to occur. The underlying, I mean, the sort of elephant in the room where you're talking about South Central is that there's been a crack epidemic there for since the early 1980s. And um, I think the story is very much about that too. It's about the breakdown and destruction of the community and the devastation that follows. And um, the problem with the crack epidemic is that it's being, it's being dealt with as though it's an individual problem. It's the problem of the individual who happens to be on crack. But obviously it's an enormous community problem in that um, in South Central. And, um, and it's still going on. But the, the money and the programs have not gone in there. And I think it's a community that has seen such uh, destruction and such, uh, you know, destruction of families, destruction of relationships, destruction. So many people have died uh, that these killings existed within that framework and within that context. I'd like to go on record saying I really don't like documentaries that go in with a script and you go into it and try and make the script happen. I think reality is so much more interesting than that. And obviously you need to work with somebody who can capture it as it happens. It's the hardest kind of filming that there is to shoot spontaneously and for it to be in focus and look fantastic. Um, but I think more than anything, it enables a, a situation and a reality to speak for itself. So I was very interested in the broader themes of this topic. You know, which I just, which I talked about, um, but obviously you don't know. You know, for example, some of the characters went through enormous changes, and uh, I think as a, as a person, when you go into those films, you change your attitudes, you change your position, and I think if you can capture that on film, it's uh, amazing for an audience. I mean, you know, we didn't know obviously we were going to meet Pam. <coughs> Uh, we didn't know that Pam was going to take us into a whole other world which we didn't expect to go into. And I think also, for example, with Lonnie's friends, the, the three stooges we call them, uh, they went on this incredible journey with us. And I think, you know, I was always trying to work out what my attitude was to them. Um, and I think the audience probably were taken through the same kind of journey. And I think, you know, we all have an incredible debt to people like Penny Baker and Lee Crump, who devised and reinvented documentary to be able to tell stories in a very spontaneous way. With, with, and it's all about storytelling, obviously, but I think with the machinery now to do it, there is no reason not to make, I mean, it seems to either make a fiction film or make a film that's out there that really tries to capture what it is that you see around you on a day-to-day -day level and, and to find a a form and a structure that enables it to be entertaining as well and hold an audience.